Good afternoon, my name is Stephen Canetto, Associate Dean here at the MSU Libraries, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the library and to the Frank and Virginia Williams Lecture on Abraham Lincoln and Civil War Studies. As many of you know, in 2017, we were the proud recipients of the Frank and Virginia Williams Collection of Lincolniana. Frank and Virginia Williams of Rhode Island donated their extraordinary collection of Lincoln artifacts, memorabilia, statuaries, books uh, to Mississippi State, and we are so proud to have that collection here. And we're so proud, of course, to have Frank Williams here with us again today. Uh, also with that collection, they established this lecture series. It's a lecture series devoted to telling the story of Abraham Lincoln, continuing the conversation about the Civil War, as well as Reconstruction. And we're so indebted to Frank and Virginia for all that they've done to support Mississippi State. So let's give Frank and Virginia a warm welcome. He's been with us for a couple of days and has uh, always, when he's here, he's always uh, imparting so much knowledge, talking about Abraham Lincoln and all that he did in his career. And certainly it's a, always a pleasure to have him on campus. We're sorry that v Virginia couldn't be here with us today. Uh, we certainly hope that she'll be able to come back uh, in May when we are hosting the U.S. Grant Association uh, meeting in May. So we hope that she'll be here for that. Thank you for being here for our program. As I said, this is the lecture series. This is the third annual lecture series. And we've got a great lineup uh, today. Uh, if you look at your program, you'll see that uh, the official welcome will be brought to us by Dr. Mark Keenum, president of Mississippi State. And he, of course, uh, is an avid supporter of the MSU Libraries. And we can't thank him enough for all that he has done to support uh, the University Library. So let's give Dr. Dr. Keenum a round of applause. We're so thankful to have him on the program today. This is actually the third program, I guess, that he's been on in the library in the last three weeks. Um, and we appreciate his support. Uh, and certainly, we know that he is here also to support and to thank uh, his friend, uh, Frank Williams. So thank you, Dr. King. Also, of course, we have on our schedule uh, on the program, Ryan Sims, who is the coordinator of the Congressional Political Research Center. He's also the archivist for the Grant Collection and also the Lincoln Collection. So if you want to know anything about uh, either of those collections, please ask Ryan. So he's going to come up and give us a, um, some information uh, about the lecture series and, of course, talk about the Lincoln Collection itself. And of course, we'll have remarks from Frank Williams. And also, he will also introduce our illustrious speaker. We're so pleased today to have with us uh, William C. Davis, or Jack, as he is referred to. Uh, we had to ask him a few minutes ago, um, so where does Jack come from out of William C. Davis? And that may be a story for a later time, right? Uh, but we're so pleased to have such a noted historian and scholar here. Uh, as you'll see from the program, he is a retired professor of history, uh, as well as many other professions. Uh, he's had an exceptional career and is also a retired executive director of the Virginia Civil War Studies Center. So we're so pleased to have you here as well. And then, of course, uh, we'll have a Q&A session after uh, Jack's talk, and then, uh, and actually, the judge will lead that for us. And then, of course, we'll wrap up with uh, some remarks from Dean Coleman. So again, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Keenum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And I want to echo Stephen and say, again, welcome to all of you for our third annual Frank and Virginia Williams Lecture on Lincoln and Civil War Studies. Um, it's just a pleasure to welcome Frank back to campus. And uh, you know, he is uh, Chief Justice Frank Williams, retired Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. But he's also, we call him, as he rightfully deserves, uh, it's Dr. Frank Williams. Uh, he has a doctorate degree from Mississippi State University, as some of you may know, as of uh, May of 2018. So we have to make sure we give him the due honor that he rightfully deserves. Well, again, this is a wonderful occasion for our university. Again, the third lecture series that Frank and his beautiful, wonderful wife, Virginia, are so kind to sponsor. You know, as I think about this university and how we've evolved over the years with our Ulysses S. Grant presidential library. It was so designated as a presidential library in 2012. Uh, but we received the grant collection uh, in the fall of 2008, early 2009. Uh, Dr. President Roy Ruby, who's sitting here in the audience, who I'd like to recognize 
provided outstanding leadership along with Dean Francis Coleman and Chief Justice Dr. Frank Williams, this triumphant made that possible, something that very few people could have realized or thought imaginable at that time, but they made it happen. And it all was over the telephone and trust that made it happen. And today we're celebrating and enjoy the fruits of that cooperation and the leadership of this wonderful triumphant for our university. You know, we're one of just six universities that is the home of an official presidential library. And not only is it the library itself so significant, which it rightfully is, but with the Lincolniana collection from Frank and Virginia, anything and anybody that's doing any type of research in history of that era, of that time of our nation, or any study of the 16th or the 18th president of the United States, are gonna make their way to Mississippi, to Starkville, to the Mitchell Memorial Library to do their research. And that makes me real proud. It makes me extremely proud. Through these remarkable academic collections, I would submit that no other university in the nation <clears throat> is doing more to bring substantive academic balance to the study of the conditions that led to the Civil War, the propagation of the war, and the long road of reconstruction and reunification of our nation. Our university offers a unique opportunity for the study of the Civil War, not from a northern or a southern perspective, but from an American perspective. We have a past, no doubt. We have a past here that continues to resonate on our campus. A campus like many in the Deep South, former Confederate states, who after the war was led by a former Confederate officer. In fact, our first two presidents of this university were former Confederate officers. But now, this same campus in the Deep South they had that leadership legacy is the home of the Ulysses S. Grant Presidential Library and Frank and Virginia Williams Lincolniana Collection. I would say this, knowing what I've read and studied about our first president, Stephen D. Lee, that if he were here today, there would be no one more proud and excited and thrilled than him to have Grant and Lincoln on his beloved campus. These collections, they serve as a bridge, a bridge connecting our history to a better present and an even brighter future. Today and for generations to come, it's my hope and my prayer that our past and these remarkable collections will stand as powerful symbols of reconciliation, unity, and humanity's ongoing journey towards understanding. As President Stephen D. Lee once said, he said, a people who do not cherish their past will never have a future worth recording. I hope he doesn't mind, but I would add to that, nor shall they achieve understanding. So, we're thrilled to have this wonderful collection, and because of the generosity of Frank and Virginia, to be able to come together and to have a wonderful lecture series to, again, study and learn more about this important era of our nation's history and the role that we're playing to contribute to that. So, officially on behalf of Mississippi State, I want to say welcome. I'm glad you're here. Frank, thank you for your leadership and all that you've provided. And Dean Coleman, thank you for your leadership. President Ruby, thank you as well. Let's have a great afternoon. 
and may God bless you. Thank you. Afternoon. The Franklin Virginia Williams Lecture on Abraham Lincoln and Civil War Studies provides students, faculty, and staff an opportunity to attend a lecture by a noted scholar of the history of the Civil War era. Each year, Chief Justice Frank, jo uh, Frank J. Williams and his wife, Virginia, select a scholar known for his or her work on the life and times of Abraham Lincoln and the era in which he lived. Now, these scholars interpret the economic, cultural, and social, military, and political decisions made by President Lincoln and the ways in which historians analyze the American Civil War. Now, our scholars utilize the Williams Collection of Lincolniana, which includes nearly 23,000 books, pamphlets, and journals on the president and his time, as well as the over 15,000 artifacts and documents in the collection, which are all housed here in the Mississippi State University Libraries. We received this collection in June of 2017. I should also add that in June of 2019, we received some of the greatest treasures that he has in his collection, which was uh, about 200 original Lincoln manuscripts, which have now been organized, processed, described, and are available for public use in the collection, as well as a collection of original documents uh, written by Union General Carl Schurz, who eventually became a senator from the state of Missouri. And for those of you who are interested in Ulysses S. Grant, led the Liberal Republican Party and was the bane of Grant's existence in his second term. Um, anyway, for those of us who study Grant. Um, the Frank and Virginia Williams Lecture on Abraham Lincoln and Civil War Studies represents the continued interest of the Williamses in the preservation and interpretation of the life of President Lincoln and the study of the Civil War. And we hope you'll join the over 15,000 visitors who have thus far visited the Lincoln Gallery, which is located upstairs in the Grant Presidential Library. So please be sure to join us after the lecture series today and each fall semester here at Mississippi State University. Thank you. Well, I'm the Frank Williams they're talking about. And it is my honor to be with you. Virginia could not join us, but she'll be with us uh, when we have our Grant Association meeting in early May uh, next year. And I'm really taken with uh, the comments of Dr. Keenum and Ryan Sems about what this collection means to you and the, and the, the Mississippi State uh, community, as well as the state of Mississippi, it was not a hard decision to make to bring it here. And that's because we had experience having the grant material here, thanks to Dr. Ruby and, and Dean Coleman and a wonderful library staff who are at work finishing the cataloging of the Frank and Virginia Williams Collection of Lincolniana. Virginia and I had made our minds up that the collection should go to a university in the Deep South and one that did not have a Lincoln and Civil War collection like ours. And because of the great care that was given by Mitchell Memorial Library to the Grant Collection that came here, as Dr. Keenum said, in 2008, 2009, we knew that our Lincoln Collection would be treated with respect and affection by all of you, and especially the great library staff under Dean Coleman and Stephen Canetto. So it was not um, hard to decide to leave all these children with you. Because every book was like a child. And I, I actually uh, did not go into post-traumatic stress when the, when the US art company came to pack two and a half weeks 
two truckloads worth of material that eventually wound up here. The other reason we wanted Mississippi State, and Dr. Keenum so eloquently alluded to this, was to help with the healing caused by our Civil War. Of course, I think all of you recognize that the Civil War did not end on April 9, 1865, when General Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia. Unfortunately, the Civil War continues in one form or another, and as Abraham Lincoln said in 1858, we are a house divided. And a house divided against itself cannot stand. And of course, he took that from Matthew. And the same is true, unfortunately, I say again, in 2019. But we hope that having the collection here and the, the grant collection and the great progressiveness of a great university will go a long way, and we think it will, toward the healing that our country and nation need so much. And to help with that is my friend Jack Davis, who is going to speak about Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln as chief executives. Jack we, and I have known each other for over 40 years. Have we, we, we've worked together, we've appeared in conferences together, and I know how loyal Jack is and how supportive he is with other scholars and others who wish to write about our middle period. But he is a man for all seasons, a man for all times, because his writings do not just relate to Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, Jefferson Davis, John Breckinridge, uh, the Battle of New Market, that was his first book, but goes into other areas, and he has a late, he has a, a great book out now, new book, that's been out for two weeks about uh, New Orleans and the battle there. I hope you'll buy it from Amazon or some other bookstore. But more importantly, Jack is the kind of empathetic person that we need in our culture and in academe retired teacher, publisher, author. He is a man that brings to our table all of the attributes that we want in someone with great character, like Abraham Lincoln, that we honor here at Mississippi State. It is um, clearly an honor and a privilege to introduce William C. Jack Davis to you uh, as our third Frank and Virginia Williams lecturer. Please welcome Jack Davis. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, this is my second visit to Mississippi State. I was here a number of years ago to um, speak at a, the Marshall X endowed lecture series and I, I can't tell you how impressed I am here today, having seen today what was then just embryonic, just being dreamed about. Um, I hope everyone in Starkville and Mississippi realizes how truly unique is what you have produced here in this library. The vision to bring all of this together in one place, uh, I think, is, is unmatched anywhere that I've been. And I think especially of the, the younger people here. Certainly great scholars are going to come here to work in the Lincoln Collection and the Grant Collection. But I hearken back to my youth in California, in Sonoma County, which sadly is on fire right now. As a teenager, I got acquainted with Chapman R. Grant, the grandson of U.S. Grant, and got to spend a lot of time in his home and be amongst the artifacts of the presidential China, uh, Grant's presentation sort. I got to touch these things that were history. And I've never undervalued, I think, the impact that had on inspiring me to want to become an historian because I could see and touch these, these things. There wasn't a whole lot of civil war out in California, if you were interested in it. So it was a long way to go to get to it. 
but to have had the opportunity to just handle these things and to think the opportunity students here have got to come here to the Mitchell Library and see what you have put together here through the generosity of the Williamses and through the generosity and the hard work of the Grant Association is, is truly remarkable. Uh, I've got to think you're going to inspire young people here simply by coming into this building and seeing these things and touching these things and learning more about them. And I can't wait. There was only one president who was going to be here four or five years ago, and that was Grant. Now they've got Grant and Lincoln. So I hope I'm invited back in four or five years to see who the next president is <laughs> you're, going, you're going to bring in here. Uh, there's, there's a lot of them who need presidential libraries. I'm delighted to be here. This is the first time in my life, I think, that I have ever given a lecture on Halloween. But uh, in keeping with the day, I have, I'm here in costume today. At least that's what my wife would say, because I tend not to dress like this at home. Um, it's, it's, it's great fun to be here with you and to talk about something that's on Americans' minds perpetually, and perhaps even more today than ever before, and that is aspects of the nature of what makes a president, what constitutes presidential greatness, what are the strengths and the flaws, the pros and the cons that you look for in a president, how do they rank with each other. And of course, we're obsessed with that now especially. You know, years ago, uh, the late, the first Sle Arthur Schlesinger started a, a every 10 years, a, a rating of all the presidents, and he got about 100 scholars, uh, historians, jurists, etc., to do their rankings. And what immediately came out of it was that Lincoln was right on the top, usually followed by Washington. 10 years went by, and this is done again. Lincoln came out on top followed by Washington. And actually, down to this day, presidential surveys still, it's always a toss-up between Lincoln and Washington as to who's the greatest president. Where it becomes difficult, however, is in ranking those who are more recent. I think most people involved in those surveys, like myself, would not even undertake to do a ranking, say, of presidents post-World War II. I mean, even 45 years after Richard Nixon left office, I think it still may not be possible to fairly judge the pros and cons of that administration or of that man. And in fact, there are places where if you speak on Abraham Lincoln, passions will run so high that it's evident that maybe it's too soon yet to be talking about evaluating him as well. We need perspective in order to, to adequately judge and to escape our own passions and prejudices if we lived through the administration of those people. So it's maybe a long time yet. Maybe my generation has to die before we can fairly appreciate Nixon. I'm not looking forward to an early death just for that purpose, I hasten to add. So even judging Lincoln and Davis, I suppose can be somewhat dangerous, but we'll give it a try. But to do that <coughs> calls for something that one of these terms academics love, a paradigm shift. Hands up everybody who says paradigm shift twice a day. No, you don't. I'll give it, academics love this stuff because they like to say things they hope nobody else will understand. And most of them do it in their books. I'll give you an example of a classic example of a paradigm shift. It, it, this, is, of course, is, is, is fictional. Uh, the captain of a battleship steaming fast at night through a dense fog unable to see. And then at the distance, there's a light. He immediately has the coxswain aboard his vessel send out a message. I'm on a collision course with you. Change your course 10 degrees to the west at once. Back comes a message out of the darkness. Yes, you are on a collision course with me. You change your course 10 degrees to the west. The Admiral radios back, this is Admiral John Smith, and I insist that you change your course immediately. And back out of the gloom comes, no, sir, you change your course at once. This is Seaman Second Class Joseph Jones. Admirals don't take that sort of thing very well. 
I demand that you change your course at once. This is the battleship Missouri. Out of the fog came the words, that's wonderful, sir, but I demand that you change your course. I am in charge of a small lighthouse. <laughs> now, in that instant, the Admiral experienced a paradigm shift, a different way at look of looking at things. And we have to do that if we're going to fairly compare Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln as commanders in chief. We have to get over the fact that Lincoln won and Davis lost. Davis was not Lincoln. To compare them fairly, we've got to disenthrall ourselves of what Lincoln was and what he has become to Americans and adopt a new paradigm. We have to judge them based upon what was possible. A friend of mine, once, who also took part in these presidential rankings, once proposed that we should take Lincoln out of it entirely and elect him our national god. And that would open a space at the top for mere mortals. Lincoln is that much ingrained in our consciousness, our sense of ourselves, our culture, our society. He's a universal figure in the American psyche. And we've got to get over that if we're going to judge him fairly and fairly compare someone else to him. So that's what I'll try to do. I'm going to look at four fundamental areas of performance that are faced by all wartime chief executives. How did he formulate <coughs> national policy and goals? How did he manage the armed forces as commander in chief? How did he marshal all of the political and social tools of war necessary for a democracy to conduct a conflict? And how did he mobilize public spirit and morale? Any judgment of the effectiveness of Lincoln and Davis has to be viewed in the context of what it was possible for each to achieve. We have to judge them on the basis of what is possible. This is often difficult in Civil War history because some folks simply don't want to accept the possible versus the impossible. I spent my whole life in this field, 50 years of it professionally, and I can't tell you how many times I've been asked the question, well, if only so-and-so had been an hour earlier here, or if only Lee had done that, or if only we'd had a plague of locusts, could the South have won the war? Uh, the best question I ever got, and I'm not making this up, could Lee have won the Civil War if he'd had the atomic bomb? <laughs> I will vouchsafe to you the answer to that question. No, because he didn't have a delivery system. I mean, can you picture Mars Roberts saying to Jeb Stewart, Jeb, here, take this big heavy thing and take it over by the Yankee lines, then ride like hell, but I won't be seeing you again. <laughs> We have to think in terms of the possible. Well, in the first instance, setting national policy, Lincoln and Davis are equally clear and unequivocal because they faced the situation at hand and virtually had almost no choice. For Davis, it had to be independence. For Lincoln, it was reunion. <coughs> in pursuit of those national policies, Davis's a particular strategic notion was to try to hold on to everything territorially. He had no choice. His political, his domestic, his foreign policies, every aspect of Confederate governorship, governors, governorship was subordinated into the overweening goal of winning independence. Hence his so-called offensive defensive strategy. Hold on to everything you can and occasionally, if there's a target of opportunity, maybe make, make a little invasion. It's very opportunistic, but very realistic. Lincoln was fortunate. He had more options than Davis, and they were less stark, perhaps. So his policy has time to evolve, but by 1862 to 63, he has realized that territory is pretty meaningless. His objective is Confederate armies. He realized that the Confederacy lived in its armies. Take its armies out of the field, and the Confederacy, by definition, will expire. And his strategy is fundamentally based 
on that understanding. Consequently, in this area, I think they probably both merit rather identical high marks as men of clear vision seeing to the central question before them. But then in the second category, this is how do they manage their armed forces as commanders in chief is where they begin to diverge. <clears throat> I, I may be telling you what you already know, but Davis, of course, starts with something of an advantage. He, after all, had attended West Point, which, however, in, in, interestingly enough, at that time was an engineering school, and it did not teach strategy and tactics. If you went to West Point in the 1820s, when Jefferson Davis did, you were a senior classman and went before you got one class that studied strategy and tactics, and that was just really, really reading about Napoleon. It was a school to produce engineers. But still, he spent several years in the, the old professional army. He had been briefly a volunteer commander in the war with Mexico. So he has some experience and understanding of the military establishment. And then, of course, uh, uh, President Franklin Pierce will make him Secretary of War, which is the equivalent today of Secretary of Defense. And there for four years, Davis really does get into the nitty gritty of the American military establishment. He will even try to be a reformer, doing away with things like the seniority system. He got nowhere with that, as no one ever did. But he at least was willing to experiment, looking at ways to run the Army more efficiently. In that era, 90%, 90% of the entire federal budget went to the military. The government didn't spend a dime on much of anything else. So he had a huge managerial task and put in A, very good effort, and B, drew from it probably an understanding of the way an army should be organized and run administratively that was second to none. He started with a firmer hand, and his experience, of course, helped him, but he would also show considerable restraint in dealing with that army. He, yet he will insert him, Jefferson Davis has the instincts of a bureaucrat. That's not a, a put down, that's simply a fact. Uh, bureaucrats don't necessarily make good chief executives, but without bureaucrats, chief executives can't govern. He inserted himself into every aspect of Confederate military management, just as he had when he was Secretary of War. In Montgomery, Alabama, when the Confederate government was formed and first in operation before it moved to Richmond, if you were to call on Jefferson Davis in his office, he had three offices. One was in the, the Confederate Executive Mansion, one was in the State Capitol, and one was in a, an old cotton warehouse that had been turned into a government house, they called it. So no matter where he was at any time of the day, he was always in the office. And if you called on him, you might find him sitting at his desk with a sheaf of telegrams in one hand, while in the other hand, he was examining samples of fabric as he was choosing the material for Confederate uniforms. He was even choosing the designs for buttons on those uniforms. That's not what a chief executive should be doing with his time but that is how totally immersed he was in the business of his military. But he is, after all, creating a brand new military establishment. However, beyond that, when it got into the operation of what would become the Confederate armies, he does not interfere with his commanders. There's a myth all of you have heard, I am sure, that one of the reasons the Confederacy died was that Jefferson Davis interfered with his commanders. He worked with them the way any good chief executive would. He consulted on the grand strategy to be pursued. That is the nationwide strategy. But he left theater strategy within each commander's department, largely to that commander, so long as it conformed to the overall grand strategy. While he stayed in Richmond, trying to support them by providing for their needs as best he could. Many expected when Jefferson Davis was elected president that, in fact, he would step out of the Capitol and go lead its armies in the field, because he is, <coughs> at that time, the South's greatest living military hero. I mean, Winfield Scott's a great military hero, but he stayed with the Yankees. So people thought Jefferson Davis might command our armies. Some hoped that he would. 
and that Vice President Alexander Stevens would stay behind and run the government. Davis might have been more comfortable doing that, but he seems never to have given it any serious thought. He stayed in Richmond supporting his armies. Yet this myth came about that he hampered the operations of his military commanders in the field by constantly interfering with them, by constantly telling them what to do, by not approving of their plans, even by transferring troops away from one army over to another in order to immobilize one army while it enhanced the other. This is all part of the much greater so-called lost cause myth, which is a myth created after the war by a number of Confederate Army commanders or military commanders trying to explain away the fact that they never really lost the war, they just wore themselves out whipping the Yankees. And a big chunk of that myth came from one man, General Joseph E. Johnston, who, and, and from his book, which was probably the, the best Civil War novel ever written, and that is his memoirs. <laughs> it, it, it's a 500-page lie. All to the point that Jefferson Davis constantly got in his way, kept him from doing what he wanted to do. He always had a secret plan for winning the war, rather like Nixon's secret plan for winning the war in Vietnam. But Davis kept getting in the way. He kept hamstringing, he kept stopping him from doing it. And it is all a fiction. Johnston was relieved from command because he refused to keep his chief executive informed of what he would do. And I think a president has a right to expect all subordinates to keep him informed of what they plan to do. Davis had no choice but to relieve him. In fact, where Davis falls down, I think, is that he did not interfere enough. It's certainly not in the case of Johnston. He didn't interfere when he should have in 1862, when two small army commanders, Earl Van Dorn and Sterling Price, were refusing to cooperate with each other in West Tennessee. Later in that year, when three small Confederate armies, commanded by Braxton Bragg, E. Kirby Smith, and Humphrey Marshall, were each invading Kentucky from a different direction and refusing to cooperate with each other, he did nothing to try to bring about cooperation. And his worst failure to step in, of course, is the crippling crisis that took over in the Army of Tennessee, the Confederate's second largest army, a crisis brought on in its command system because of General Leonidas Polk. Some people say his name should be pronounced Leonidas. Some say Leonidas. I think it should be pronounced Mud. Uh, a born schemer, a congenital liar, and Episcopal Bishop of the Southwest. <laughs> it's an unusual personality and a man of God, but he had been a close friend of Jefferson Davis's and rather like General Grant, Davis was not always a good judge of his friends. And Polk will scheme against Davis and try to use him in his own internal squabbles with other generals as he kept seeking to get higher and higher command. And he destroyed, virtually destroyed the command system of the Army of Northern of Tennessee, West of Tennessee, setting each general against the other in his schemes. And Davis should have done something about that, but did not. On the other hand, Abraham Lincoln, like Davis, mostly stayed out of military movements and minutia and left all of that to his military establishment. He didn't have that much of a military background. You know, he was twice a volunteer in the Black Hawk War, the first time as a captain for a few weeks, and then he mustered out, and then he enlisted again as a private soldier. How, ma how many officers will re-enlist as, as a private soldier? Not that many, I suspect. Like Davis, he would share his views on grand strategy with his generals, but then he left theater strategy to them, just as Davis did, and left it to the War Department with only one instance, with only one exception at Norfolk, Virginia in 1862, when the Army wasn't doing anything, the Navy wasn't doing anything, and Lincoln essentially borrowed them and led his own little expedition to take Norfolk, Virginia. Otherwise, he stayed out of things. But then by the summer of 1862, he started doing what Davis unfortunately would not do. He will relieve or transfer more than a dozen army commanders if they didn't produce results, if they sowed dissent within their own command systems, 
if they did not obey the orders laid down for them. And he did that despite much greater political fallout and complications than Davis would have faced if Davis relieved an army commander. Lincoln also more effectively inserted himself into the internal discord in the high command and did not allow himself to be used by dissidents the way Davis, unfortunately, was unknowingly used by Polk, by General James Longstreet, by General John Bell Hood, and a few others who had their own private schemes for advancement. Yet Lincoln, at the same time, would be responsible for some of the dissension in his own Army High Command because of his adherence for too long to too many examples of a phenomenon not peculiar to the Civil War, but pretty peculiar to it, and that is the so-called political general. Yep. This, is a, this is a war of the people, a civil war in a civil, civil democracy, and so you can't just, dic you can't govern by dictate or by rote. You have to have the people with you in a democracy in order to govern. Lincoln had a dozen different constituencies in the North, a huge German-American population, mostly recent immigrants, and even bigger Irish-American immigrant population. You had Northern Democrats who were in favor of prosecuting the war. You had Northern Democrats who were opposed to prosecuting the war. You had mainline Republicans. You had abolitionists who were much more radical than the Republicans. You had some of the old know-nothings, their American party who were against just about everything, and then said, when you asked them what it was, they said, I don't know, hence the term know nothing. There are all these constituencies that he has to try to bind together in order to get them headed toward their one overarching goal, which is reunion. And the way he did that was to make some of their popular leaders generals. Because when you have a popular Irish American who's suddenly a general, he can get tens of thousands of other Irish Americans to enlist. And the same with the Germans and the others. So politically, it was pretty smart policy until you sent these characters out into the field. Some of them had never spent a day as a soldier in their lives. Some of them were politicians and nothing else. Some of them were incompetent. A couple of them were barely well enough to stand but they were popular with these constituencies. And they will cause him tremendous problems throughout much of the war. And this may sound really bizarre and archaic, but in 1942, FDR came under a lot of pressure to make Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor of New York, a general in the army. He's an Italian-American, tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands of Italian-Americans. This is the man who read the, new, the, the comic strips to the people over the radio during a newspaper strike, and he thought about making him a general. It didn't happen. We will still occasionally have a political general from time to time when it's either necessary or if there's a military tribunal that needs to have civilian jurists on it. Frank is a general, not a political general like these others, I hasten to add. Um, so this will probably still happen, but nothing like it did during the period of the Civil War. And time after time, most of these men will let him down. But Lincoln won't weed them out because of the political fallout until two things happen. First of all, until Grant becomes overall commander of Union armies in the spring of 1864. And Grant is so popular that he can now fire the political generals. And Lincoln can simply say, well, Grant runs the army. Go complain to him. And then secondly, that fall, Lincoln is reelected, and he knows he can stay the course now and does not have to play this game. Conversely, Jefferson Davis will only allow two politicians to become high-ranking general officers. And overall, he will only appoint about half as many political generals as Davis does. And of all of them, only one ever achieves and exercises high command in the field, and that's John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky, who fortunately turns out to be a pretty good mid-level commander. But Davis will not try to contain the havoc caused by the professionals in his army, like Polk, like Joe Johnston, like Pierre Gustave Toutain Beauregard, 
He wasn't tall enough for all that name. He was only about this tall. <laughs> and he, he always, he, he signed letters to Franz Gustav, thinking that Pierre sounded too foreign. <laughs> or like Braxton Bragg, who's sort of the perennial bad boy of the Confederate Army. Yet this is what Davis was largely stuck with. And keep in mind, as awful as Braxton Bragg may have been, he conceives and launches more offensives than any other Confederate Army commander except Lee. And the problem is they fall apart, largely due to Bragg's ineptitude. But D Davis needs somebody who's willing to try to fight. And he's severely limited by a lot of the material he had to work with. His options were very limited at times. Overall, I think Lincoln is more effective in this general field. And it helped that he had more to work with to begin with. In this third category, that of marshalling the political and the social tools of war, both men will revolutionize their societies. Both of them will oversee, just consider this, institution of a national, national income tax, conscription, that is the draft. Jefferson Davis will do it first. Suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and the declaration of martial law when necessary. Davis will do it first. Censorship of the press. This is anathematic to people in a civil democracy, but it will happen in order to try to get vital, in order to keep vital information from getting into the press and then getting to the enemy. Lincoln's great revolution, of course, is emancipation as a war weapon. And toward the end of the war, the 13th Amendment, which recasts American society forever. But Davis may even exceed Lincoln. He authorizes impressment, that is, the military seizure of private property for military use. It's called impressment. It's really theft, except you would be paid with Confederate money, which meant it was really theft. <laughs> Control of production and distribution of staple commodities. Wage and price controls. Rationing, the rationing of salt, rationing of alcohol, the rationing of corn and other grains, the institution of a national prohibition, in part to try to raise morale in the armies, to discourage drunkenness in the armies, but chiefly to save corn, which was needed for the draft animals, and an intricate system of local, state, and even national welfare. The Confederacy will become the first welfare state in America in many respects. In 1864, the Union was much as it was in 1860. But the Confederacy has been revolutionized into the most socialized polity until the New Deal. All I hasten to add, not because of idealism or any consistent governing program, all due to necessity. By 1865, Davis is even toying with various plans for a partial or full emancipation in spite of his own constitution that prohibits emancipation. It was a matter of survival. Lincoln's social revolu revolution took lawful property from others who were in rebellion. Davis would be taking lawful property from his own people. Lincoln's revolution began as a weapon that merged with the holy cause of the Union, but was compatible with the sympathy of his people. Davis's revolution was all expedient, born of necessity, but almost all of it counter to the sympathy of his people and their attitude towards small government, keeping its hands out of the lives of private individuals, and much of it in conflict with the founding ideology of the Confederacy. That is what necessity drove him to. Considering all the obstacles faced in American culture and political tradition, both of these men, oh, both continentally and in their own halves of divided America, I'd say that Davis performed probably about as well as Lincoln did in this mobilization, and maybe even more dynamically and innovatively as he pushed social, political, and constitutional limits farther than Lincoln. A president in a civil democracy has to exercise the political arts as well. And there, there is no question but that Lincoln was far superior to Davis. Lincoln understood 
backwoods politics. Lincoln had been a circuit lawyer. He had talked to the people in courthouse towns. He knew how you played the game of politics. And he was a crafty, not devious, but a crafty and canny politician. He knew how to give something in order to get something. He knew how to make a deal. He knew that half a loaf was better than nothing at all. And he knew how to practice the political arts to a degree that maybe not many other presidents have equaled, and certainly few exceeded. And that suited his personality. Davis's personality was completely the opposite. The idea of acting like a politician to him was disgusting even to think about. It was pandering to the people. It was playing for popularity. You probably, all of you in your lives, have known somebody, if you're lucky you didn't work for them, <laughs> who people didn't like, and who might have said, well, I'm not running a popularity contest. That's somebody who really is hurt by the fact that people don't like him, but he doesn't know how to do anything about it. And that's Jefferson Davis. He simply did not have the gift of the political art of connecting with people, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in front of a group or in front of a nation. And had he known how to do it, he probably wouldn't have tried anyhow because it was undignified. That's not how a gentleman should act. People should automatically see that I am right and do what I want them to do without me having to persuade and to cajole. Consequently, if somebody disagreed with Lincoln, oh, he'd tell a couple of shaggy dog stories, maybe bring out some other anecdotes, give a little, get a, a little, and come to some kind of a median ground. If somebody disagreed with Davis, he would sit down and write them a six-page letter in which he lectured them on how they were wrong and he was right. <laughs> That's not how you bind the people in a democracy to you either personally or administratively. Then there's their performance in mobilizing public opinion and morale. How they acted as politicians and party leaders. How did they use patronage, et cetera? How did they build coalitions? What were their roles in sustaining the morale of the men in the armies? Well, I've already told you, Lincoln was very good at those political arts. Davis was not. But it's important that we not try to judge them by today's standards and our today's public relations obsessions. Yet both of them, in the context of their own time, ought to have had an understanding of the uses and the necessity of public opinion and of party management. Both had witnessed the log cabin campaign of 1840, arguably the first modern political campaign, one of the first ones that depended on some pressing of the flesh and the, project, and the creation of a candidate in the media that might not be necessarily the reality of the candidate, but you're now selling the idea rather than the fact. There's no question Lincoln understood the value of molding public opinion, as witness his Cooper Union speech in 1860 and his 1860 campaign for the presidency. Davis, on the other hand, was never in a national political campaign and only ran in two local campaigns, one for the House of Representatives in 1846 and one for the governorship in 1852, and he lost that one. Yet he still, I think, understood public relations somewhat. He just didn't like to try to employ it. Both men will limit their public appearances and their speeches as president. That's not unusual. This was pretty common for a president. It was a big deal in 1828 when James Monroe toured the nation. The president didn't leave Washington. And as it was, Monroe did it in two halves, the North one year and the South the next year. The president simply didn't leave Washington. Davis will actually make three trips across the Confederacy from Richmond headed west. The first one to Vicksburg, the second one to Chattanooga, and the, second, the third one not even that far. You'll see that he found, unfortunately, that each trip west, he had less distance to go before he hit the edge of the Confederacy, as it was constantly losing territory. But when he was on those trips, he didn't address the people. He didn't go to the armies and address the soldiers. 
even to display himself. He met with legislators and talked about governmental issues. He met with his military commanders, but he forewent the chance to reach out directly to his people and the soldiers in the ranks. It would have been foreign to his nature to do otherwise. Lincoln made no trips further west than the Army of the Potomac in Western Maryland. He didn't need to. His armies in the West, commanded by Grant and Sherman, made their own morale through victory. That Army of the Potomac was always the, the problem child, the one that he had to go to again and again as it went through a, an unfortunate two years of inept commanders and, and internal political turmoil within its high command before it finally settled down under George G. Meade and became the effective army that, that indeed it always had the potential of being. But when Lincoln visited the armies, he talked to the generals, but he reviewed the soldiers. He let the soldiers see him over and over and over again. And that's how many people here have ever seen a president, even at a distance? You, you've been dining out on that story all your lives. <laughs> And you know, the, the first president I ever saw was Harry Truman. Uh, I was in a, 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 a stroller in Independence, <laughs> and my mother was wheeling me down the street, and Harry was home. He lived on Delaware Avenue, about eight blocks from where we lived. And on one of his constitutionals, we apparently bumped into Harry. Well, I have parlayed that into me advising him on the Marshall Plan, <laughs> uh, desegregating the armies. I mean, you name it, and I told Harry how to do it. Uh, the point is, that is, that's an electric connection that is probably second to none, to see a president in the flesh. And somehow the politician in him gave Lincoln to understand how powerful that could be in making that connection with the soldiers. And he didn't seem to mind even if he looked a little foolish. When he went to see the Army of the Potomac, when George uh, B. McClellan, was in command, McClellan would intentionally try to make Lincoln look foolish. You know, he called Lincoln uh, Uncle Ape, the original gr gorilla, things like that. Um, so he would, he would assign a donkey, or the smallest horse he could find for Lincoln to ride, so that Lincoln's heels almost were dragging the ground as he rode. If Lincoln rode under a tree and a, a bough almost knocked his top hat off, he was actually, there's a wonderful picture of, of him uh, riding with his, his long johns showing up to his knees and desperately holding onto his top hat and trying for all the world to hold onto the, 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 the donkey's mane. And the soldiers will write about these when they see it, but they don't laugh. What you see instead, it's, and it's amazing, the uniformity with which you encounter this, soldiers will describe the look on his face. And the adjective they use is careworn. And if you look at Lincoln's photos through the war, you can see how the war is gradually killing him. And an empathy breaks out among the soldiers for the commander who's actually sending them off to die. There must have been a heap of trouble on the old man's face. I could see it there, and I felt sorry for him. That's just one quote that I happen to recall at the moment. He made that connection with, that, with the soldiers through all of that. So they, I think they wanted to believe in him and he just had the gift of making them believe in him. And when he reviewed the troops, time after time, you'll read a letter or letters written afterward in which the soldier will write home, well, Ma, you know, here, at, here at City Point, the Confederacy came out, uh, the, the president came out and reviewed the troops today, and he looked out at the crowd, and you know, I think he looked at me. Well, he wasn't looking at individual soldiers. But these men so wanted that connection, they choose to believe that as he cast his gaze across the crowd, they had actually made a one-on-one -on -one connection with him. Imagine how powerful that can be in building morale. He also wrote public letters that were published in the newspapers. He gave access to the press for interviews. Davis will do neither. It simply is foreign to Davis's nature to do such a thing. And then there's the photograph up. You know, this is the, the latest hot technology. The photo is the Snapchat of the Civil War. And the technology was such that there are probably, I, I would guess, maybe over a million photos taken during the Civil War, virtually all of them portraits. <coughs> 
And rather as you did in high school or junior high, when the, your photo was taken and you got a whole bunch of wallet-sized pictures that you traded with people, soldiers would have their photo taken. It was called a carte de visite because it was the size of a visiting card. And they could buy a dozen of them for a dollar. And they would trade them amongst their fellow soldiers. And they would send their pictures back to their families at home. You've probably got some of these here, but every archive across the North, I know, has a carte de visite album in which are the photos of the boys who are off at war and maybe some of their friends. But time after time after time, you will find one of the mass-produced carte de visites of Abraham Lincoln. He's a member of the family, included in their family album. That's a powerful connection. It's hard to exaggerate how powerful that is. Davis is photographed once, possibly twice, during the war. And again, he wouldn't have made use of the photo even if, he'd, if, if, if it had been available to him in mass produced. Of course, Davis doesn't have Lincoln's eloquence. We can't fault him for that. Nobody has Lincoln's eloquence. No other president has then or since, and his record isn't under much threat currently. He spoke elemental truths cast in prose constructed of almost Elizabethan cadences redolent of Shakespeare and the King James Bible with all the implicit holy overtones that those cadences conveyed. Davis spoke partisan dicta expressed in political cliches. He only said one thing that is remembered as a quotation. Anybody remember, know what it was? All we ask is to be let alone. It's an address, a letter he sent to a special emergency session of the Confederate Congress called after the firing on Fort Sumter. All we ask is to be let alone, a line he stole from Vice President Alexander H. Stevens, who had used it earlier in Savannah. Davis simply doesn't have the gift of eloquence. We can't fault him for that. That's not something you necessarily learn. To his credit, unlike later executive office leaders, he did know his verb tenses. Uh, he could spell the word potato, and he didn't tweet. Uh, maybe, maybe the odd chirp among friends, I don't know. Lincoln personalized his cause in himself for the soldiers and people. Davis simply didn't make that personal connection with them during the war, though ironically he did to some extent after the war when he became a sort of a martyr representing the perceived sufferings of all former Confederates when he was imprisoned at Fort Monroe. By 1863, soldiers and civilians in the Union were fighting, as they put it, for Father Abraham. In the Confederacy, by that time, the people and the soldiers identified with Robert E. Lee. There would never be a Father Jefferson. So how do they measure up as commanders in chief? The late, great historian David Potter years ago wrote something so absurd I can't believe it came from him, in which he stated that had the roles been reversed, had Lincoln been president of the Confederacy and Davis president of the Union, the Confederacy would have won its independence. It's just beyond ridiculous. Reversing the roles, in fact, Davis's handicaps that I've outlined for you, probably would have been largely negated by Northern material and manpower superiority, and the Union still would have prevailed. But taking them as history leaves them to us, they can seem almost evenly balanced based on their skills and not on the ultimate result of the war. Each saw to the essential military policy for success. Each, each got his policy through Congress, and Davis's more radical policy actually had an easier time of it thanks to the fact that there was no organized opposition. The Confederacy is a one-party entity. Davis managed his political generals better, and they were never a problem for him. Lincoln managed his army commanders better. Davis, is may, Davis may emerge somewhat ahead in marshalling some of the social tools, while Lincoln unquestionably comes out on top in the vital element of morale and public opinion. Does that mean they were roughly equal as commanders in chief? We can't say with certainty. Lincoln was Lincoln a truly great man. Jefferson Davis was a good man who did the best he could 
against a lot of obstacles, some of them of his own making. But it's important to remember another paradigm that we need to shift a bit. It was not necessary for Davis to defeat the Union to achieve Confederate independence. It was only necessary to keep the Confederacy alive long enough for the Northern people and the Northern government to lose the will to keep fighting. Had that happened, we might have had a very different outcome, and you might have the papers of some very different peoples here at Mississippi State. Thank you all very much for joining me here. Thank you, Jack. Questions, please? Yes, Can sir. Can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, I recall a book whose name I remember, but whose author I've forgotten. It's called Lincoln's Sword, the writing of the pen is mightier than the sword. And it, it, it shows a number of Lincoln's major uh, speeches or letters, public letters. Uh, how they were initially drafted and then modified by him over a period of time before they finally were delivered. And it suggests that, that although it should have been some natural eloquence involved, but that he very carefully crafted these letters yes. uh, and that he, it didn't just spring out of his head and he wrote them down. You'd write them and you change the wording, shift the arguments around. Uh, it was a good example to me of it. Yeah, that, that's, quite, that's quite true. Uh, the Gettysburg Address has, you know, he was constantly uh, uh, amending and shifting and editing a little bit, I guess right up to the time that he delivered it. Um, I don't know why, it just reminds me of a student paper that uh, once said that Abraham Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address while writing to uh, Gettysburg on the back of an envelope. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the first airmail. Uh, but you're, you're quite right, and I think every President, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan's inspiring Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall speech was being steadily edited and, and right up to the moment that he delivered it. So, and I think most presidents will probably, will probably would do that. Yeah, there's a question, hand back. One of the famous statements that uh, he made, not as a, as a president, but as a soldier was, stand fast, Mississippians, in the battle of Buena Vista. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, uh, as a result of that, he's a military genius that he was. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, that is, uh, who, uh, at the Battle of Buena Vista in 1847, I guess it was, uh, Davis is commanding, I think it's the 2nd Mississippi Rifles, or the 1st, I've forgotten now, and uh, uh, is attacked by uh, a Mexican commander. So, and Davis had formed his line in sort of an inverted or a V, I guess, like this. And the, uh, the Mexican commander led his soldiers right in toward the center of the, B, the V, which meant they were being shot at from both sides. So it, it was a very inept move on the part of the Mexican commander, but it, it helped lead to a victory in that battle. Uh, and out of that came this, that's what made Jefferson Davis a military hero, not just in the South, but in the nation. And that's, and it's a result of his reputation as a hero that had, that he was elected president of the Confederacy that some expected him to become the leader of their armies. Leading one of his, uh, I forget if it was Bob Toombs or one of his other political opponents to say the Confederacy died of a V. <laughs> because of that. Yeah. All the way in the back there. Oh, uh, something you said caught my attention. Uh, uh, David said that all we want is peace after he had attacked Fort Sumter. Um, could you please elaborate on that kind of divergent point of view, having the South attack a federal uh, garrison mm -hmm. and expect peace? Well, yeah. Uh, the question was Davis' statement, all we ask is to be let alone. And how do, you, how do you square that with the fact that, of course, it's the Confederacy that opens fire on Fort Sumter and fires the first shot? Uh, he and, and Confederates, I don't think, really saw a conflict because they saw, if, I'm not saying this is the case, I'm saying their point of view, that the firing on Fort Sumter was a defensive act because South Carolina had seceded, therefore Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor is now Confederate territory and it's occupied by a hostile force, the, 
you know, 79 men or whatever it was under, under Major Anderson. So in, in opening fire on Fort Sumter, they're simply defending their own territory. So they don't, I, that does not, in their minds, clash or conflict with stating we want to be left alone. If, if they leave us alone, we won't, we won't open fire on them. Uh, I, I grant you, it sounds contradictory to us today. But the whole notion was that they did not want a war. We just want to leave with what's ours, which is our, our territory. And their, their interpretation of the Constitution was such that they had only loaned sovereignty over them to the federal government, meaning it was always theirs to take back if they chose to do it. Uh, I'm not saying that was the case. That was simply the, the point of view they, they chose to adopt. Uh, but that's one of innumerable questions like that that's kept guys like me in business for years and years and years. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Did uh, Davis uh, willingly accept the presidency or reluctantly? Or what was his feeling about being elected president of the Confederacy? His, um, his wife, Verena Davis, who's a fascinating character. She's really a 20th century woman, much more politically astute than her husband. Uh, in her memoir, wrote that when the writer came up to the plantation uh, outside Vicksburg with the word that he had been chosen as president by the Montgomery Convention. Uh, the look on his face was the look of a man given a sentence of death. Um, Davis, I think, had some beneath the surface, some understanding that he did not have the arts of a politician. He would rather have been a soldier. And in later life, he often said he if he'd had his druthers, he just would have been a cavalryman. Uh, there's no politicking by contending candidates in Montgomery, Alabama, when the, the president is chosen. What happened was that the, the seventh, sixth, then a seventh state joined there. But six states will choose their president and vice president. And it was commonly, and each state got the same number of representatives in this convention that they had had in the House of Representatives before. So the powerhouse is Georgia, which has eight congressmen, therefore eight representatives. And Georgia is the home of this triumvirate of, of prominent national uh, uh, politicians, Robert Toombs, uh, his best friend, Alexander H. Stevens, and Howell Cobb, whom Toombs and Stevens loathed. But everyone assumed Georgia would get to have the president because it was the biggest state. Toombs assumed he would be president. Others assumed that he would be president. Unfortunately, what they, they reckoned without is that Toombs, despite his, his size, he's a big, hale, bluff man, uh, he had a very low tolerance to alcohol. And this will surprise you, but sometimes in the evenings where politicians gathered, they would be having some Kool-Aid and ginger snaps. <laughs> and at a party a day or two, evening or two, before uh, they were to meet in convention to choose their officers, uh, Toombs had the fatal second or third glass of wine and made an ass of himself. His friend Stevens wrote a letter describing it, and he drank himself out of the presidency because they realized that our president's going to be just like the union's president. He's not just an administrator. He's not just chief executive. He's our chief diplomat, and we can't have him meeting representatives from other nations of the world and acting silly. So to Toombs is out of contention. Uh, some were talking about Alex Stevens. Some were talking about uh, one or two others that you will never have. Charles, hands up everybody who's heard of Charles Conrad in Louisiana. At that moment, he was the next most likely man. A fellow whose name now escapes me had written to Jefferson Davis. He was from the Mississippi delegation and said to him, if this convention should choose you to be president, would you accept? And for once in his life, Davis came up with the perfect politician's response. I have no desire to be president. I would rather stay here at my plantation and raise my roses, doo-dah, doo-dah. But should my country call, I could not say no. And I think he was sincere. But into this vacuum in Montgomery rides Alexander McCord, I think is his name with the letter from Jefferson Davis in which he does not say he would say no. And he's, in some ways, the perfect man. He was never an ardent secessionist. I mean, he stayed in Washington as long as he could. Uh, he believed in secession as a right, but he didn't think it was wise. On the other hand, he wasn't one of the radicals 
from South Carolina. I mean, anything radical that happens has South Carolina behind it. Just as a rule of life, take this with you from me with Jack's blessings. Watch out for South Carolina. <laughs> Uh, uh, of course, that's because Virginia Tech doesn't have to play South Carolina. Um, but they, they, what happens in all revolutions is once they get going, the radicals on both sides are left by the wayside as people rush toward the middle where there's the greatest strength. And Davis is a perfect man in the middle. And so he's, it, Toon still thought he was going to be elected. And he woke up on the morning of February 8th, 1861, thinking he'd be president to be told that the other delegations had already elected Davis. And all, all, all Georgia was going to get was the vice presidency. But Davis took on the job and came, came there immediately. And I think he did the best that he could. And I think with sincerity. Nobody adopted the, the cause of the Confederacy more than Davis to the point that by the end of the war, I'm getting off my subject now, when it's evident to so many people in Richmond that the game is up, the one who could never admit it was Jefferson Davis. And I think in part it's because he had already seen two of his sons die. He, in fact, will have four sons. He will outlive all four of them. The Confederacy had become another one of his sons, and he could no more willingly preside over the death of that than that he could willingly preside over the death of another. Son, he was dedicated. I think there's no question of that. I'm sorry to have taken so long. You had a hand up back here, sir. Uh, I appreciate your, your lecture, your scholarship, and I also appreciate the, the grant and Lincoln archives we have here. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you a question. Uh, you talked about the uh, the Confederate uh, Army and the That's an in interesting perspective. Um, the formula that I've applied here is, you know, is mine, and somebody else could come up with an entirely different one. I think it's useful here because you have two men at the same time trying to perform the same job and largely under the same conditions and circumstances. But if you went 20 years earlier or 20 years later, you re it would, might require an entirely different formula because of the exigencies of the moment in which you're judging them. So the issues of one time aren't going to be the issues of another. And my guess would be that you, if you got 10 historians together and asked each of them to come up with a set of talking points by which to judge somebody, you might get 10 different sets of talking points. But, but your point about in, engaging in this exercise as perhaps a means of generating further discussion and people actually thinking about this, if, if I've understood you correctly, uh, is something that I, th I would like to see happen. What you've got to be careful of is that you don't make it so uh, confrontational, for want of a better word, that you don't close the ears of the people you're actually trying to, to get through to. Because America, not just America, it's people take their history very seriously. And there is a large segment of the population and a large part of our history in which people 
believe on a basis not of facts, but of faith, with a small f. Uh, that's one of the reasons there's, there's a great deal of mythology around, and I can't tell you, I've even stopped trying to debunk myths, because more often than not, people believe them because it means something to them, so if you attack the myth, they take it as an attack upon themselves. And you, you're never going to get through to somebody if you've got their back up because you, they think you're attacking them. And we've got to be very careful, I think, to be understanding and sympathetic or empathetic to the things people have chosen to believe, even as we may try to persuade them, well, there is another viewpoint that you ought to consider, and that, or maybe this, whatever this view or that view is, uh, can't be uh, rationally supported. But, you know, he, humans are not rational beings. This will surprise you, I know. We're moved by emotions and by excitements and by panics. That's how, that's how we react. It's probably how all mammals react. Consequently, that's one of the reasons we had a civil war. There are issues over which we simply cannot, people can't agree. And uh, I don't want to get into modern politics, but look at issues like, like abortion or the death penalty. You will never get compromise. You're either one or the other. And sometimes when you hit a situation like that, a war is the only way to solve the problem. It doesn't solve it, but at least it gets a decision. It may not be the right decision or, or the one that's best for the country at the time. Uh, the big problem I have with, and then I'll shut up, with a, a lot of my colleagues as historians, wonderful people and I, the best times of my life with them. But there is often from, uh, historians will often speak sort of ex cathedra, um, the, almost issuing dicta of their own, that I've studied this and this is how it is. And we fail to understand the emotional component of people who may have had ancestors involved, people who may come from a part of the country where there's a, a culture that has a vested interest in a certain set of beliefs. And that when you challenge that, you alienate people and achieve nothing when goal, your goal really ought to be just simply to try to en enlighten. Um, it's, a, it's a tough task. Lincoln would have had the ability to do it. Davis would not. It's just as a matter of personality. I'm sorry to go on so long with that. Anybody else? Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. From uh, Franklin, Virginia Williams, and uh, Mississippi State University Libraries. Help me with this. <laughs> Thank you. We give you a signed copy of what's become our brand, which is Fritz Eichenberg's engraving made just before World War II. The determination on Lincoln's face. You see crosses in the eyes here. Uh, Fritz uh, escaped from Nazi Germany and settled, fortunately, in our country and became a great engraver and educator. So we want we want you to have that. You don't have to you don't have to put it in the overhead compartment. <laughs> we, we'll, uh, we'll we'll get it to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful afternoon. And uh, we certainly want to once again uh, thank our speaker. <laughs> and our other guests on the uh, platform here, certainly uh, Dr. Keenum, uh, Chief Justice uh, Williams, and uh, our folks here at the library, Stephen Canetto and Ryan Sims. Please join us for some refreshments. And that noise that you hear back there, you know it's Halloween, so it's spooky, but it's really the wind coming, <laughs> coming in back there. Also, I'd like to uh, indicate to you that if you have time this afternoon, 
Uh, there's a new exhibit up in the hallway there near uh, the uh, Grant Williams collection, and I think that you would like to see that. It's some more of the uh, items from the Grant collection. And uh, before we go, I'd like to rec uh, recognize Dr. John Marzalek, who is our executive director of the grant. So please, uh, let's applaud. Thank you very much. <laughs>